Just over a week ago, one of the two Patreon polls that helps decide some of the videos that you see each month concluded with a rather decisive message that they wanted me to do a video about battleship guns in World War II, similar to the one I did a while back about anti-aircraft guns in World War II. Now, at the time, I thought, oh, okay, that'll be interesting, but it should also be relatively easy, because I've done all the legwork creating the spreadsheets and the formulas, etc., to make this all work, so surely I just have to plug in the data and we'll see how it goes. We'll spit out the results, put them all in a nice neat graph, and then I'll be able to tell you which guns are better than others. But, oh, how, how wrong I was. <laughs> you see, it turns out that it's actually very difficult to quantify battleship guns in a way that it really isn't when it comes to anti-aircraft guns. And hopefully, during this video, you'll see what I mean, as well as seeing what the results were, and then you can obviously tell me in the comments whether you would agree or disagree with them. So, for that, let me explain a little bit about the technique, because it's the same technique I used when I was rating the anti-aircraft guns, but I didn't explain that particularly much in that video. So, I know a few of you have asked since then. Effectively, what I do is I create a spreadsheet table, I plug in all the various variables that we are looking at, so you can think like average rate of fire of the gun, weight of the shell in this case, well that was the same for the anti-aircraft guns, and then you have to start deciding what's important for a battleship gun. Because, for example, armor-piercing capability in an anti-aircraft gun isn't really that important, but it is very important for a battleship gun. And once you've plugged all of those into your spreadsheet, you then have to find a way to compare each of those values against each other, but in a way that spits out a result that is consistent across values. Because, of course, let's say something like rate of fire is measured in rounds per minute. Weight of shell is measured in kilograms or pounds, range is measured in yards, and so on and so forth. And each of these values is incredibly different. You know, range is measured in tens of thousands of yards. Weight of shell is measured in thousands of pounds or hundreds of kilos. And armor piercing capability is measured in single or double digit inches. And of course, it's all very mobile because armor penetration obviously will eventually trend down to nothing. Whereas range, well, even the shortest range World War II battleship gun is still going to have a minimum distance of well over 20,000 yards. So how do you bring all this into coherence? Well, the formula that I used is as follows. For each line, which obviously defines across multiple results, you calculate the minimum and maximum value. And then that gives you the range. So, for example, with, say, the maximum range of the guns, the absolute minimum value was 24,000 yards, the absolute maximum value was just over 46,000 yards, although in two separate tables, so I'll explain that later. But in any case, you can then work out what the range is. You also then calculate the average figure that's involved for that particular data set. And then I enacted a formula, which was basically Whatever the result for that particular gun is, so if we're using range and we take, say, one of the earlier model US 14-inch guns, so the kind you'd find on a Pennsylvania-class battleship, for example, well, it turns out that the World War II modified variant of them has a maximum range at maximum elevation of 34,300 yards. So from that, you take away the minimum range that's involved in the data set, and then you divide all of that through by the difference between the absolute maximum and absolute minimum values within the entire data set. Now, what that does is it effectively takes the minimum value away. So you have your difference between maximum and minimum and where this particular figure that you're analyzing sits within that. So you've created a zero to something figure. And by dividing it through by the total, you, of course, get a percentage, which you can then multiply through by 10, round off to one decimal place. And what you've effectively established is where on this scale that you've created does this particular figure sit on a scale of 1 to 10? 
So to help with that explanation, let's use completely arbitrary figures and we'll say that the maximum and minimum penetration values for armor-piercing shells were, let's say, 20 inches and 10 inches. So you then have a gun within your data set that you're looking at and it, the armor penetration of its shell is 15 inches. So you take away 10 from the 15, that gives you 5, and then you took look at the overall difference, which is 10, obviously, so 5 over 10 gives you 0.5, you multiply that up by 10 again, you're back up to 5, and you have a score of 5 out of 10, which makes perfect sense because, of course, 15 stands directly in between 10 and 20. So if you're 20 inches of armor penetration is obviously your 10 out of 10 because it's a relative scale and your 10 inches of armor penetration is 0 out of 10 i.e. it's the weakest gun well then your 15 inches of penetration is 5 out of 10 because it's halfway along now what this means of course is that if you have a gun that is performing well outside the parameters one way or the other everybody else shifts up or down the scale somewhat because of that but this is why you have large data sets and also it can reflect just how good a gun is if it completely outperforms everyone else or indeed how bad one is if it makes everyone else look good in comparison to itself. So that gives you one point of data, whether it's the range of the gun, the armor penetration capability of the gun, etc. And then once you've added up all the various criteria you're measuring, you can then average out the figures for the various scores that each gun has received to give an overall average score, which then compares to all the other guns. Now, there are two important points to note here. One is, what variables are you measuring? This is obviously very important because if you're measuring a, something that actually has nothing to do with how good the gun is or isn't, then that could complicate and skew your results. But also, you have to take into account how important is each thing that you're measuring. Now, this is interesting because as much, if perhaps not more so than the variables you choose to measure in the first place, how important you weigh each variable is perhaps the single biggest opportunity for personal bias to creep in. So, for example, many of you will know that I don't tend to value range figures that are well in excess of 30,000 yards. A little bit over is fine, but those of you who've watched my videos long enough will know that, you know, just due to simple mathematics and physics, it's almost impossible to hit a maneuvering opponent at a range much beyond that. So for battleship versus battleship engagements, personally, I don't really see the point of being able to shoot 40, 45,000 yards per se and so it would be relatively easy for me to turn around and go actually you know what I'm going to cap the importance of range so perhaps I'm going to impose some arbitrary distinction that I've come up with like say 32,500 yards and say right anything that can reach that range gets a score of 10 because you know it's reached the maximum possible reasonably effective range and anything that can't reach that will obviously get a lesser score based on the formulas because there's still some margin of useful range left. But one, of course, that would be mostly arbitrary on my part. And two, it's far too easy to get narrow and blinkered when it comes to assigning an importance to a variable like that. Because, of course, you might have an instinctive reaction or a, in, or a theory or hypothesis about why something doesn't factor into an equation particularly heavily, like, for example, my opinion on range. But if you're honest with yourself, you have to then stop and think, OK, but that's one very particular aspect of it. Now, you might be thinking, what do you mean? Well, yes, I still stand by the idea that you probably are never going to hit much of anything beyond 30,000 yards because as I said, the enemy can just manoeuvre out of the way if they're watching your muzzle flashes. But the overall range capability of a gun actually has far more to do with 
other factors, because if a gun can, say, range out to 30,000 yards at 30 degrees elevation, then its shells are going to follow a certain ballistic flight path. And that means towards the end they're going to be plunging quite a bit, but also you're going to have to be elevating further to reach more reasonable battle ranges, say 20 to 25,000 yards. And that's going to affect the ability of your shell to punch through somebody's belt armour because the incident angle is going to be greater. But if you've got a gun that can shoot out to 45,000 yards, well, sure, you're probably never going to hit anything at 45,000 yards, but that thing's going to be firing at closer ranges, say 20, 25,000 yards. Practically speaking, compared to the much shorter range shell, in a straight line. Now, obviously, it's not going to be doing that. It's going to be coming in at a, some degrees of angle, but it's going to be coming in at a much shallower angle, which is going to improve its ability to punch through belt armor. Of course, there are other variables that might affect how the shell flies, but that is a fairly major one. And so having a very long range gun in and of itself, all of a sudden, doesn't seem too bad. Now, again, in this hypothesis I've done, or consideration I put forward for you, you're going to be looking at a situation where both ships are still engaging at the somewhat more practical 20, 25,000 yard bracket. They're not exploiting the ability for, to send their shells much, much further in and of itself, but they are exploiting the capability that having that potential gives them to better perform or perform worse, depending on the gun, at much closer ranges. And now, all of a sudden, I've constructed an argument to say, well, actually, range is important because range in and of itself is just a distance. How you use it is completely different. So if you use your exceptionally long range gun to try and hit some people at very long range, well, in my opinion, you're frankly a bit of an idiot, but that's down to your choice. That's not actually down to the capability of the gun. Conversely, if you then use that extremely long range gun to shoot somebody basically in a point and click interface style at short range. Again, that's a choice that you have, but it's only a choice that you have because your gun had that ridiculous range capability in the first place. And this effectively, I hopefully you can understand, is what I mean by considering all the variables and not allowing your own personal biases to say, right, I think this is less important or I think this is more important. So I'm going to assign some scaling factor to this to make it affect the formula more or less. So you can rest assured that for this and the anti-aircraft gun video before, I've not allowed that to happen. I've not given any modifiers to any of the scores. I have simply presented each of them as a score out of 10, and they all have equal weighting when it comes to the final calculation. Unlike the anti-aircraft gun video, the battleship's guns, although they do have a pro and con score as well, for the most part those are just fairly average, I've only made specific notes or specific changes to the pro or con score when a battleship gun has a very, very notable feature that either is to its advantage or to its disadvantage. And there are plenty of good reasons for this relative lack of pro and con listings, but two of the biggest ones are, firstly, simply put, battleship guns by World War II were a far, far more mature technology than anti-aircraft guns were. Anti-aircraft guns didn't even exist until the First World War, and none of the anti-aircraft weapons that saw service in the Second World War really had much, if any, connotation with the very primitive efforts that were made in the early to mid and even the latter part of the First World War. Even the pom-pom was a much more advanced variant of the original two-pounder that came about in the late 10s and early 20s. And so various nations having some rather interesting difficulties or indeed advantages with anti-aircraft weapons at that point is not exactly surprising. Conversely, the large rifled shell-firing battleship gun, well, that's been around at the point that we're talking about in World War II for well over half a century. So whilst there's a lot of variability in guns' capabilities, etc., etc., most nations at least have some idea how to build a half-decent battleship gun. And 
Thus, as a result, there's not too many absolute pros and cons when it comes to a lot of these weapons outside of the measurable performance indices. Now, I can hear some of you saying, well, what about, you know, something like, say, the early US standards with their guns being clustered far too close together and then this affecting their accuracy or British practice of having their magazines for the charges and the shell rooms in the opposite alignment to what most of everybody else did and so on and so forth. Yes, these are issues that could be addressed and quantified in pros and cons. However, this is about the guns, not about the entire weapon system. So where your magazines are arranged, that's part of your overall weapon system. Whether you stack your guns really close to each other or spread them far apart, that's an issue to do with your turret design. It's not actually anything to do with the value of the gun itself, because that gun can be put in other situations, and indeed in a number of cases was put into other situations, different mounts, different ships, etc., where it would perform differently based on the environment it was placed in. But if you just took those guns off of those different ships and lined them up separately on the test ranges, they have an underlying core performance upon which you can either build a really, really good weapon system or you can compromise it and make a worse weapon system. But whichever way you do it, that's on you. That's nothing to do with the actual baseline capability of the gun. But, of course, it's inevitable that some issues are still going to be affected by external factors beyond just the gun. For example, the big elephant in the room there would be range. You know, most guns probably could shoot out a lot further if they were allowed to elevate higher, but a lot of turrets just wouldn't allow you to elevate beyond a certain point, and indeed some of them were modified in the interwar period to allow guns to elevate higher so that they could get longer range. Now, that is a definite factor in how the gun is going to perform, but also is that strictly gun-based performance, or is it something to do with the turret? Well, I think in the, that particular case, when it comes to range, it turns out it's a bit of both, but you can't necessarily extract one from the other, and so, you know, probably should be included, because ultimately, whilst we are looking at mostly the capability of the gun, and as we said before, not the capability of the entire weapon system as a whole, we are also trying to come up with some kind of practical indication as to what these guns would have done and how they would have performed relative to each other had they faced off in actual combat in World War II, and not just kind of a spherical cow in a perfect vacuum scenario. So, with all that out the way, you might be asking, well, why still did do you think this was a particularly hard one to decide? Well, it's simply the fact that humans, in this particular case me, are still in charge of which variables to put in, even if we're not letting any particular variable have more or less bias than another. And that means you can start off with what seems like a good idea, and then it spits out a bunch of results, and you look at it and you go, no, no, there's something wrong here, there's something very wrong here, and I don't like it, and not just that I don't like it, I know for a fact that this result is objectively wrong. So let's go through the data, the three iterations of it that I eventually ended up with, and you'll see what happened. So the first set of data, the original format that I was going to use, to try and determine what was the best and worst battleship guns was as follows. These elements I'm going to first describe are the bits that didn't change. First, I decided I was going to have to divide the guns into two groups. And the reason for that is that effectively there were two generations of weaponry present on battleships in World War II. There are what I've defined as pre-1930 guns and post-1930 guns, or if you want a slightly cruder variant older World War One era weapons, and more modern weapons. And I decided it would be unfair to group them all into one big pile, because there are some truly excellent World War One era weapons, 
well, pre-1930 weapons, I guess. And there are also some actually relatively poor post-1930 weapons. But simply because of the technological change that's involved, some really good weapons could get overlooked if you are looking at, say, the pre-1930 stuff, and some of the not-so-good weapons of the post-1930 era might end up coming out looking a little bit more positive than they actually realistically were. So once you've done that split, I initially decided to characterise each gun by the following. Its average rate of fire. Now this would not be the maximum rate of fire. This would be whatever the various documents said was the expected rate of fire, or if there was a range of expected rates of fire, then I went for a figure in the middle of all of that. Now, why include rate of fire when the typical rate of fire in any engagement, regardless of how fast the guns could theoretically shoot, was about around a minute? Well, yes, that is the reality of most naval warfare. However, once you get into the end game stages of a particular naval combat with battleship guns, that's when rate of fire actually becomes quite important. So for getting in those killing blows once you've established the range, it's very important. If you manage to get a, the drop on someone and ambush them, like say Washington versus Kirishima, rate of fire is very important to make sure you hit them hard and make sure they stay down. And also, the overall rate of fire, much like uh, the range that we discussed earlier, can have interesting secondary effects. Because yes, you might have a rate of fire that's much higher than one round per minute. You might have a rate of fire that's only barely approaching a round per minute. But when you're trying to sustain a rate of fire of about a round per minute, which as I said is average in the typical battleship engagement, if you are comfortably within your capabilities to do that, then you're going to have a relatively simple time of it. Whereas if you are just about scraping within your capabilities to keep that rate of fire up, the chances of something going wrong are actually a lot higher. So rate of fire definitely is in. Then you have the weight of shell. Now the weight of the shell, again, is somewhat important because at the end of the day that shell is going to land aboard. It's going to carry a certain amount of kinetic energy and a heavier shell is going to have more kinetic energy and mo more momentum traveling at the same speed than a lighter shell. Also, a heavier shell will retain its energy better throughout its entire flight regimen, so it's going to end up at longer ranges with a bit more hitting power, which is obviously a good thing. And the sheer mass of the shell is going to be reflected in just how many fragments of it are going to go scything around inside the target vessel if it manages to hit and then detonate. A relatively light shell can only send out so much metal. A heavier shell, assuming it's got decent bursting charge, can send out a lot more metal and thus do a lot more damage. So that's why weight of shell is in there. Range has to be in there. Uh, we've already gone over range as a prior example, so I won't say too much more about that, but suffice to say, you know, whether or not you can hit a target at a given range is quite important, and once you get beyond a certain range, having an extra long range does give you additional capabilities. Armor penetration. Now that's a fun one. Where do you measure its armor penetration? Do you measure it at the muzzle? Well, that might give high velocity guns with somewhat lighter shells an unfair advantage. Do you measure it at the very end of its range? Uh, when the shell's basically just dropping into the water, you can't shoot that shell any further. Again, it might be a useful factor to determine retained energy, but it does give heavier shells something of an advantage, but then when you're looking at things in terms of realism, you probably won't be hitting anything there, so does it really matter? So you have to strike a middle ground. And I decided to go with what is the armour penetration capability of a shell fired from that gun at 20,000 yards? Because every gun could reach 20,000 yards, and 20,000 yards is a fairly reasonable range to be hitting your target at. And so it seems a good value that you can check across all guns and say, right, well, relatively speaking, at the a decent battle range, this is the capability of this gun relative to these other guns. So that's in there. Now, I also included rate of elevation and rate of train because a lot of these guns have to be reloaded 
at either zero or very low angles. So if you're engaging in a long-range firefight, how quickly you can get that gun to come down to be reloaded and then rack it back up again to shoot may well be a factor in determining the outcome of the battle. So rate of elevation seems a reasonable one to put in. Rate of train, so that's how fast the guns can swing around onto the target, in some circumstances could be very important, especially close range fights or ambushes, but also more generally, the faster the guns can train, the more easily they can and more quickly they can adapt to changes in circumstances, whether that be if it turns out that your bearing estimation of your target vessel after the first few salvos turns out to have been horribly off, or if you need to switch targets. So rate of train was included. And then finally, before the um, somewhat arbitrary pros and cons, the bursting charge weight. And the bursting charge is on an armor-piercing shell the amount of explosive that's actually in that shell. Now, why is this important? Well, the amount of explosive present does have a couple of major influences over how much damage you do. Firstly, you know, it's a big chunk of explosive. <laughs> I don't think anybody particularly wants to be near 10, 20, 30 or more pounds of high explosive when it detonates. This is not generally known to be good for your health, and it's not good for the health of any particularly delicate or even particularly non-delicate systems in the immediate vicinity either. So the sh simple blast effect of that shell going off scales to a degree with the amount of explosive that has arrived. Now, obviously, thanks to things like the square cube law, as the explosive element expands into a larger and larger space, there's obviously increasingly more space to occupy, and therefore it's not a linear progression. If you set off 10 pounds of explosive and then you set off 20 pounds of explosive, you're not going to get twice the damage, or you're not going to get the same amount of damage at twice the distance. And there'll be a, a limiting factor there, but it's still going to do more damage because it's double the amount of explosive. So that's one thing to consider. The other thing to consider is somewhat related to the weight of the shell, which is that those shell fragments, when the shell explodes, are propelled, okay, partly by the kinetic energy of the shell as it's been fired and is arriving aboard the ship, but in large part by the explosion of the bursting charge. And if you have a small bursting charge, then it can only impart a certain amount of kinetic energy to those fragments, and therefore they can only do a certain amount of damage. If you have a larger bursting charge, then obviously there is more energy to be imparted to those fragments, so they will do more damage. So having a large bursting charge, generally, as long as it doesn't compromise the overall armor-piercing capability of the shell in the first place, is a good thing. So that's the final criteria by which we're judging this. Now, when it comes to some of the finer details within the, those factors, Obviously, because this is a comparison of World War II battleship guns, we're using the World War II versions of those guns. Now, for the post-1930 guns, that doesn't matter because that is the version. But for the pre-1930 guns, it does matter. Because, for example, if you look at the capabilities of the US 14-inch guns, both the slightly earlier models that were on the Pennsylvanias, for example, and the later models that you might find on something like, say, the Tennessees, well, they have two distinct phases of existence. And the version of that that is found in their World War I form, with World War One era shells and so forth, is distinctly less capable than the refitted and reworked versions of those guns in World War II. So you have to take the World War II variant because that's the one that would actually have been fired, and indeed, as a bunch of Japanese battleships found out, Surigao Strait was fired um, during the conflict. Likewise, you have things like the 14-inch gun on the Congo class, and also the Fuso Nisei class for that matter, although they didn't really do all that much with them, and that also modified in the war. The British 15-inch gun, again, different set of shells, different set of performance characteristics in World War One, as compared to World War Two, and as we'll see, is actually the only gun that appears on both listings, <laughs> and so on and so on and so forth. So, which guns went in which categories? Well, for the U.S. Navy, there were four entries in the pre-1930 gun category: the 12-inch guns, as found on the Arkansas, the 14-inch guns, which I've mentioned before, as found on things like New York, Texas, Arizona, Pennsylvania, etc. The later 14-inch guns, as found on 
the Tennessees and New Mexicos, the 16-inch guns found on the Colorados, and then you have the Japanese, the 14-inch gun as found on Congos, Fusos and Isseis, and the 16-inch guns on the Nagatos. The British have the 15-inch gun, which was found on almost all of their ships, and the 16-inch guns found on the Nelsons. The Germans have a single entry here, the 11-inch guns found on the Deutschland class. The Russians have the 12-inch gun that was still found on the Gangert class. And the French have two entries, the 12-inch gun found on the Corbet class and the 13.4-inch gun found on the Britannia class. And then we move over to the post-1930 guns, i.e. the modern guns. For the US, there's two entries, the 16-inch 45 found on the North Carolinas and South Dakotas, the 16-inch 50 found on the Iowas. The Japanese have a single entry, the 18.1-inch guns found on the Yamato. The British actually now have two entries. There's the 15-inch 42 again, and you might think, well, hang on a minute, didn't we just include that in the pre-1930 guns? Well, yes, we did. However, whilst there was a degree of modernization done to guns that were on World War I ships, such as you know Queen Elizabeth, Warspite, Renown, Valiant, and those are the guns that we're looking at for pre-1930 guns in World War II. There's also the extensive modifications done to Vanguard's guns, and so effectively the post-1930 15-inch 42 entry that we're looking at is Vanguard's weapons, because they have somewhat different capabilities to everybody else's for a number of reasons, most of which in, uh, include the theoretical capability, even if they never used it in practice, because, you know, well, it didn't actually fight in a war, of using superchargers. You then have the 14-inch guns from the King George V, obviously, and the French have the 13-inch guns from the Dunkirk class and the 15-inch guns from the Richelieu class. The Italians have a pair of entries, the 12.6 rebored guns from the Doria and Cavour classes, and yes, I know those guns originally started life as 12-inch guns pre-1930, but because they were bored out and refitted post-1930, I decided to include them in the post-1930 weaponry because they're now a different caliber. If they'd kept them at 12 inch, I would have kept them in the pre-1930 weapons, but they didn't, so here they are. You've then got the 15 inch guns from the Latorios, and of course, the Germans coming in with the 15 inch gun from the Bismarcks and the 11 inch gun from the Scharnhorsts. But when that was all considered and the formula spat out the results, well, some of the results were as you'd roughly expect, but there were a couple of major issues. Now, you can see here the two data results, the pre-1930 and post-1930 guns, and some of the biggest, if you like, surprises were that somehow the 11-inch guns found on the Deutschland class were scoring about the same level as a 15-inch gun on a Queen Elizabeth or Warspite, just below the capabilities of the 16-inch guns found on the Colorados, and actually well above some weapons like the 14-inch guns found on the Congos or the Tennessees. And I'm pretty sure any naval aficionado will pretty quickly recognize that no, the Graf Spee's guns were not anywhere near that capable. The same story actually comes when you look at the post-1930 guns, because all of a sudden the 11-inch guns found on the Shan horse there are actually scoring better than the 15-inch guns found on the Bismarcks, as well as better than the 13-inch guns on the Dunkirks, the 14 or 15-inch guns that the British were using on the KGVs and Vanguard. In fact, the only weapons that score marginally higher than the 11-inch guns found on the Shan horse under this score system are the Richelieu's 15-inch guns and the 16-inch guns of the North Carolina, South Dakota, and Iowa classes and the 18-inch guns of Yamato. And once again, whilst, you know, Scharnhorst was a fairly nice ship, I don't think any serious historian is going to sit there and argue that Scharnhorst had a better armament than Vanguard or even Bismarck. <laughs> so why was this? Well, I went back through the data and I realised that there were a few issues with it. Not with the actual data itself, the data itself was accurate, but the issues were I'd included rate of elevation and rate of train. 
And rate of elevation and rate of trend, they were included for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. But then I realized, of course, those are issues with the turrets, not strictly the guns themselves. And of course, the 11 inch gun being so much lighter meant that if you are putting on a battleship scale turret on a battleship scale vessel, or, well, a large armoured cruiser or heavy cruiser hull when it comes to the Deutschlands, of course it's going to turn quicker, of course it's going to elevate better, and because in both cases these guns were scoring top of the class in those particular factors, it was pushing their overall average score way, way up disproportionately high. And thus, although each individual data set was accurate, the choice of data <laughs> meant that we weren't getting a result that anyone would recognise as anywhere near credible. So my initial reaction was then to strip out any data that was related to the turrets themselves. So rate of elevation and rate of train had to go. And I also eliminated range, because as mentioned earlier, range was affected by how high the turret allowed you to elevate, not necessarily what the capability of the gun itself was. And that gave rise to this second set of data. Now, this looks considerably better. The 11-inch guns of both the Deutschlands and the Scharnhorst have dropped down quite considerably, and the rest of the results are probably more in line with what you'd expect. But then I had to stop and think about it for a little while, because I thought, okay, I'm definitely keeping elevation and train out, because that is definitely a factor of the turrets. It's not really got anything to do with the guns themselves, other than their weight. And the gun's weight is not being measured in this category, because we're talking about the performance of the guns as ship-killing weapons. But what about range? And that bugged me for a long time. And then I remembered what I've actually now explained to you in this video earlier on, which is that, yes, whilst range is tied into the turrets, it is very definitely a material factor in how the guns actually performed in the Second World War. There were instances where some ships could get the range and other ships could not. And there were instances where shell performance from one or the other was either off or particularly good because of those inherent values we talked about earlier that come with having a very long-range weapon. And so I came up with the final data sheet, which looks like this, and this involves adding range back into the equation. So the final variables under consideration are the rate of fire, the weight of shell, the range of the gun in its form uh, in World War II, its armor-piercing capability at 20,000 yards, the weight of the bursting charge, and then pros and cons where absolutely applicable. Now, I would have included, to be fair, the circular area probability uh, or the 50 percentile rate, i.e. some measure of the accuracy of the gun itself, but unfortunately I could not find reliable values, or in some cases any values, for the majority of the guns. I could find it for some, but not all. And therefore, it would be unfair to include some definitive data values and then either ignore or make up values for the rest of them. Now, I'm sure those bits of data do exist for each and every gun, and I was able to unearth some additional data for some guns from various archival documents. But I suspect it would take a lot, lot longer to establish them for all of these weapons, and I just didn't have the time to do that. But... You know, if at some point down the line somebody either can come up with or point me to the resources necessary to establish the accuracy levels of every single gun in this list, then I can always include that as another set of data and that will modify the score somewhat again. But in any case, going from worst to best, in the pre-1930s gun category, the absolute worst weapon that was rated was the Corbet's 12-inch gun. That's probably not a tremendous surprise to anyone. The Corbets were not exactly the world's best dreadnoughts at the time that they were built, let alone by World War II, and the only reason this particular gun's even in the system at all is because, well, 
the French did technically bring a couple of them back online for limited combat operations before the fall of France. So they did see some kind of action, but with an overall score of 3.3, they don't really have a lot going for them. They have the worst armour penetration of any of the guns on the book, scoring a a flat zero because they're the lowest value they're not particularly great with the weight of shell either uh, the range is pretty pathetic they've got a slightly above average bursting charge which is quite surprising considering it's only a 12 inch shell but that probably reflects the fact they're using an older shell anyway and of course with that terrible armor piercing value it doesn't do them all that much credit their rate of fire is kind of average as well but nothing really much to write home about then you have the 12 inch guns from the Gangut class, the Russians, Russians only entry actually in this category. Now you might be surprised as to how on earth the Russians have ended up in the second worst position because you semi regularly will hear me say that the 12 inch Gangut weapon was probably one of the best 12 inch guns developed, and yes, it was in World War I. But there are only three 12 inch guns on this list, um, and the Russians had not done an awful lot of work with the Gangut's weapons, although apart from renaming the ships, since the First World War. So whilst they actually score relatively high in their overall rate of fire, obviously the weight of shell is going to be quite low. It still is ultimately a 12-inch weapon. Range really lets it down. Um, the 12-inch Russian gun was capable of massive range, but the elevation on the Russian ships even if it had been slightly modified compared to what it was capable of back in the First World War, was still not that great because it still wasn't all that high. Armour piercing capability, I mean, it comes in at 2.5 out of 10, which for a 12-inch gun is not actually too bad, but again reflects the fact that they haven't really done all that much work on their shells. Bursting charge is all right, but with an overall score of 3.8, it's simply a good 12-inch weapon that's been somewhat left behind. Then we come on to the last 12-inch gun on the list, the one that's found on the Arkansas. Now, to be perfectly honest, it's not that brilliant a weapon in most senses. Its range is the worst. The shell is pretty light. It's the second lightest shell in the categorizations. And the bursting charge isn't anything much to write home about either. Again, not a surprise. It is a 12-inch gun. But because the US had updated its armor-piercing shells, the armor-piercing capability of the 12-inch gun on the Arkansas at 20,000 yards is actually not that bad. I mean, it's not anything much to write home about in terms of the overall categorizations, but at 4.3, it's only just below average, which isn't bad considering it's competing mostly with guns in the 14 to 16-inch range. And it gets a bit of a leg up from the fact that it actually has a quite high theoretical rate of fire. So if Arkansas had ever been caught out in a battleship duel, it could have at least spat a lot of shells downrange before anything dramatic happened. Then leaving the realm of the 12-inch gun, we come on to the uh, joint next weapons. So that is the 11-inch gun on the Deutschland and the 14-inch gun found on the earlier US standards. Now, you might be thinking, hang on, how can these two be even remotely comparable? Well, again, it's the tyranny of averaging out figures. Because, broadly speaking, that 11-inch gun on the Deutschland really doesn't score very well. It's got the lightest shell. It's got the smallest bursting charge. Again, not surprising. It is, after all, an 11-inch weapon. Its armor-piercing capability is awful. It's only slightly better than the 12-inch guns on the core base, and bear in mind the core base had been um, retired prior to the war. Basically, the only reason it's getting up at this point is because, thanks in large part to a fairly high elevation on the gun turrets, the Deutschland's 11-inch gun could actually shoot out a fair old distance. And again, being a 11-inch gun, it actually had a pretty decent rate of fire. In fact, it had the best rate of fire. And those two factors kind of drag up to a score of 4.3. The early standards 14-inch gun is almost an inverse of that. It's got the worst rate of fire, joint worst rate of fire, in fact. But its armor-piercing capabilities are pretty spectacular. A 7.1 out of 10 for the early 14-inch weapon. 
bursting charge not particularly great actually um, us guns generally don't have that big a bursting charge but the weight of shell and the overall range is about average so both of those guns coming in at 4.3 so just below the overall average and then we have the last weapon to score below a 5 which is the 13.4 inch gun on the britannia class of france now Overall, it's nothing particularly to write home about. The weight of shell, the range, the armor piercing, they're all relatively low. They're not awful like some of the earlier guns, but not really anything spectacular. Rate of fire is about average, but where it comes in, again, because it's actually using an older shell, is it's got a very heavy bursting charge. So if, with its somewhat mediocre armor-piercing capabilities, it actually manages to make it way, its way into your ship, that shell's actually going to hurt a surprising amount. So with a score of 4.8, the 13.4-inch weapon. Now we move on to a perfect score of 5.0, and that's the later 14-inch guns found on the American standards. Now, in these cases they actually have some pretty nice values. Their range is quite good. I mean, we still haven't touched on 15 or 16 inch weapons, but they're competitive on range with a score of 7.0. Their armor piercing is very good at 7.9. Weight of shell is about average at 5.3. That's not exactly surprising. The caliber is kind of middle of the pack. But they are dragged down somewhat by the fact that their rate of fire is not spectacular and their bursting charge is also not particularly spectacular. In fact, the 12-inch gun on Arkansas um, has a larger bursting charge. In fact, the only shell that has a smaller bursting charge than the US 14-inch shells in World War II is the 11-inch guns of the Deutschland class. So, uh, unfortunately, that drags the overall score down slightly, so there you have it at 5.0. Then we have the 14-inch guns of the Congo class. And the Fusas and Isas, I suppose, but mostly the Congos, because, you know, they actually use them. And that comes in with an overall score of 5.5, largely thanks to either average or above average scores in every category, except, again, Bursting Charge, um, which isn't particularly brilliant. But it's got a decent rate of fire, it's got a decent weight of shell, and it's got, in its modified form, a pretty good range, and actually surprisingly good AP values as well. So that's the Congo class guns for you. And then just missing out on a podium position is the USA's 16 inch guns as found on the Colorados. Now that's not to say that the Colorado's guns score poorly in all categories. They've got slightly above average range figures, not actually as good a range as the modified 14 inch guns, but that's thanks to the fact that those guns had been slightly more modified by the time you got to 1939 or 1941 than the Colorados had been. They're somewhat let down for their caliber by their bursting charge, but it's still around about average. So range and bursting charge, not necessarily what you expect from a 16-inch gun, but still not bad overall. And the Colorado's guns actually top out the table in two categories. They have the heaviest shell in World War II of all of these pre-1930s guns, and they have the best armor penetration capability. It's just that when that 16-inch shell arrives aboard, it's not going to do a spectacular amount of damage as compared to one or two of the other guns that we're going to see a bit later on, which do have even more spectacular bursting charge capabilities. But all of that, to be honest, would still probably have netted it a pretty high place on the table if not for the fact that, as long with the earlier standards 14-inch weapons, it has the joint lowest rate of fire. And unfortunately, it's also one that's most heavily backed up by data because during the Battle of Surigao Strait, West Virginia went into full-on rapid fire mode. They were ordered rapid salvo fire, still only managed about around just over one round every... 40 seconds or one salvo every 40 seconds so if it wasn't for that i'm pretty sure the gun would have placed a lot higher but as it is coming in fourth place just missing out on the podium so that brings us to our podium place guns now your natural fact you have two guns sharing 
joint second with a score of 6.4, and that is the 16-inch guns found on the Japanese Nagato-class battleships, and the 15-inch guns found on the UK's, well, almost all of all the UK's battleships. They have a similar rate of fire. The Nagato's gun obviously has a slightly heavier shell. In fact, the second heavier shell, just a fraction lighter than the Colorado's shell. And the Nagato, in its modified World War II form, has considerably more range. In fact, has the longest range of any of the guns under consideration at this point. But, with all that said, its armor-piercing capabilities are only about average. Whereas, in the 15-inch gun's case, its armor-piercing capabilities are not too bad. It scores a 6.7 out of 10, which puts it in third-place position behind the modified Congo's shells and the 16-inch shells of the Colorado's. The weight of shell with the UK was a little, just a little bit behind. Um, the range for the UK's 15-inch guns, when you're talking about, let's say, the World War II variants found on the refits, War Spite, Queen Elizabeth, Valiant, Renown, etc., is about average. But what brings the UK gun up just a little bit is the bursting charge, because it has the second highest bursting charge of any gun in the pre-1930 category, so it's going to do an awful lot of damage when it arrives, and with 6.7 out of 10 for armor penetration, it's probably going to do so. And it's also one of the guns that actually gets a slight modification from the pro and con boost because it actually is a spectacularly accurate weapon. Well, well above average accuracy. And that's just enough to put it into approximate contention with the 16-inch guns found on the Nagatos in overall terms. And then edging both of them out by 0.1 is the 16-inch guns found on the Nelson class. Now, initially, it actually doesn't start off very well for the Nelsons at all, because they share the bottom spot in terms of rate of fire with the Colorados, um, albeit that it's, they seem to be able to exceed that somewhat when fighting against Bismarck, with taking Rodney into account, but nevertheless, that's what the figures say. But it unlike almost any of the other guns, it turns in fairly solid performances across all the other categories. Now, the weight of shell is not the top, but it's still 8.8. .8. It's a lightweight 16-inch shell, so it's not as heavy as the Nagato or Colorado's guns, but it's still a 16-inch shell, so still quite chunky. Range is pretty solid, uh, with a score of 8.6. Its armor-piercing capability at 20,000 yards, because it is a somewhat light shell, is not the best but it's also still fairly competitive certainly better than average but actually interestingly enough at 20,000 yards not again strictly on paper as good as the USA's 14 inch shells or the 16 inch shells fun thing obviously being again the despite on paper facts Nelson's guns or Rodney's guns more specifically seem to have overperformed against Bismarck in that engagement but since that isn't tabulated and quantified, we can only go by the data we are provided. But it has the biggest bursting charge of any gun present by a long, long way, with the exception of the British 15-inch shell, which is close, which means that once that 16-inch shell hits and penetrates, if it penetrates, there's going to be a very, very, very great amount of damage done in this category, which overall just about edges the Nelson class 16 inch gun as the top spot for pre-1930 weapons. And so we move on to the post-1930 guns. So these are the weapons that were developed in the 1930s and in some cases technically right up to the 1940s, but they are the weapons of the more modern battleships that you would see on the high seas in World War II. So in this case, it should come as very little surprise that at the bottom of the pack is the poor old 12.7 inch reboard guns on the Italian Doris and Cavours. Let's face it, no one was expecting them to appear anywhere else, considering that the, well, apart from the Shan Horse, the next smallest caliber that appears is a 15 inch weapon. But, you know, the poor things score flat zero, i.e., lowest in the category for everything thing bar one. So they've got the lightest shell, they've got the shortest range, the worst armor penetration, the smallest bursting charge, 
they do score pretty well with a 7 out of 10 for rate of fire, but with an overall score of 2.4, well, they mainly seem to exist to serve the point that you can't really make a 12-inch gun competitive in World War II, no matter how much work you put into it. Then, uh, next lowest on the list, so again, probably not a massive surprise, the 11-inch gun on the Scharnhorst. It's likewise very low in most categories. Its armor penetration 20,000 yards is not great. It's only slightly better than that of the Doria Cavour guns. Its bursting charge is only is literally a matter of less than a couple of pounds more than the Doria's and Cavour's 12.6 inch weapon. The weight of shell is the joint lowest, but the range and the rate of fire, whilst the latter somewhat unsurprising, and the former, thanks to the high elevation of the turrets, is actually quite good, and that brings up to an overall score of 4.3. So, with a Shan horse, if you're going into battle against another battleship, sure, it can probably hit you at a reasonably extended range and pepper you with lots of shells, it's just they're not really going to do all that much. It, well, they might annoy you a bit, but nevertheless... Moving on to what you might think of as the, the true category, the big heavy guns. Now here there's actually a fairly tight pack of weapons. Uh, the next one up at a score of 4.8 is the 13-inch guns on the Dunkirks. Really only let down by their weight of shell. It's a 13-inch gun, so of course it's going to be relatively light. And although its armor-piercing capability is actually quite spectacular for a 13-inch gun, it's still not brilliant compared to some of the other shells under consideration here. Albeit considering that some of the shells under consideration are coming from some pretty powerful guns, the fact that scoring 3.7 with a 13-inch gun is actually pretty good. The bursting charge is right on average at 5.1, and with the third longest range, it's actually putting in a pretty creditable performance there. Rate of fire is all right, but overall score 4.8. Not bad, but slight towards the lower end of the pack. Also appearing with a score of 4.8 is the Littorio's 15-inch weapon. Now, that might come as something of a surprise to you, but it will come as relatively less of a surprise that the Littorio's gun was compromised somewhat by the fact that it was hilariously inaccurate most of the time. Because that really, really doesn't help it when you're trying to, you know, actually hit something. The bursting charge as well is not spectacular. It's actually very low, especially given that, you know, we are talking about a category that includes 12.6, 11-inch and 13-inch guns, and the Italian bursting charge on the armor-piercing shells is low enough that it's actually lower than some of those other weapons. But it does have a very good armor-piercing value of 8.6 out of 10 at 20,000 yards, it's actually, surprisingly enough, got the longest range of any of the guns out there. Um, but it's doing that by firing a fairly lightweight shell. But in what's a fairly tight race for the middle of the pack, unfortunately its overall rate of fire, which is quite low, in fact it's the lowest of any of the guns in this category, does let it down quite spectacularly. Which means that with a score of 4.8 it can only compete overall with the 13 inch guns of the Dunkirk in terms of absolute value. Now of course it's going to hurt a lot more if you get hit by an Italian 15 inch shell than a French 13 inch shell, but quite frankly you're much more likely to get hit in the first place by the 13 inch shell whilst the uh, poor old Latorio kills somebody in the next postcode. This obviously serving to bear out that this is a measure of the overall utility of the weapons, not just necessarily their ability to um, hurt something if they hit you. Then coming in at 4.9 out of 10, so just 0.1 of a point higher than the Dunkirk and Latorio's guns, is the 14-inch gun from the King George V's. It's got a relatively decent rate of fire. The weight of shell is not that great, albeit you know, it is a 14-inch gun, so that wasn't exactly too shocking. Range is okay. Armor-piercing capability 20,000 yards is not that great. Bursting charge is a little bit above average, which considering that it's a 14-inch shell competing with 15, 16, and 18.1-inch shells is actually quite surprising. Indeed, that does have quite a large bursting charge. But what has managed to edge it up into its current position just about, instead of maybe dropping it just below the previous two guns, is the fact that it is actually provably a very accurate weapon. 
um, see the Warship International article uh, that I've mentioned before, which mostly looks at the Italian gun, uh, the 15-inch gun, and why it was inaccurate, but also in passing looks at various other guns and discovers that actually the British 14-inch gun was an incredibly accurate weapon as far as its shells went. So that increased accuracy is why it's here. And of course, much as poor old Prince of Wales is maligned in its fight with Bismarck, bear in mind it's a brand new ship and it's the ship that actually scores the first hit in that engagement, hitting Bismarck a fair amount of time before Bismarck hits Hood. Then we have the first gun to edge over the 5 out of 10 mark with a score of 5.1 out of 10, and this is the 15 inch 42 as found on the Vanguard. Now, some people I know will still argue the toss over whether or not Vanguard could fire supercharges, but quite frankly, as I've said before in various videos, um, DK Brown, who was both a constructor in the Royal Navy, so you know he actually knew what he was talking about because he'd actually worked on Vanguard uh, in, earlier in his career and also had access to all the Royal Navy's documents. And of course, again, earlier in his career, the people who'd actually built her. Um, well, he and a number of other reputable historians have all said that, yes, Vanguard was capable of firing supercharges. Her mountings were strengthened in order to do so, but in peacetime, which was her entire career, she wasn't issued with them and didn't use them because of the concerns around the additional wear on the gun barrels, but that she would have been issued with them in wartime. And that made her fairly unique because she was the only 15-inch armed ship that both had the capability of using the supercharges and had her guns capable of elevating to 30 degrees. So, I'm going to trust his word on that. Um, I think I'm on fairly safe grounds. And thus, using the values that would occur if Vanguard is using the superchargers, you find that, thanks to her modified gun mount, she has a pretty decent rate of fire. The weight of shell is not massively brilliant. It's 3.8 out of 10. It's not tremendously bad but there are some much much heavier shells out there range again not anything particularly great to write home about it's really being sort of held up by its rate of fire at this point but armor piercing capability for a 15 inch shell is doing pretty well especially considering it's a effectively a worked over and heavily upgraded world war one gun um, at 4.1 out of 10 the bursting charge is really helping at uh, 5.7 out of 10 it's actually got a similar level of bursting charge to the 14 inch and actually has along with the 14 inch the second largest bursting charge of any of the shells under consideration and then she gets a slight boost right at the end because, as with the 15-inch gun in the pre-1930 category, it is provably a spectacularly accurate weapon. And so with a score of 5.1, there is Vanguard. Next, with a score of 5.3, we have the 15-inch gun from Bismarck. Now, Bismarck starts off strong out of the gate with a score of 10 out of 10 for average rate of fire yes it theoretically had a even higher rate of fire than that which i credited it with uh, for the purposes of this particular analysis but as any decent analysis of bismarck's guns will tell you the absolute theoretical maximum rate of fire was something of a pipe dream because everything's kept breaking down but with such a fast rate of fire in theory even once you downgraded that to account for the fact that, you know, you didn't want everything to break, so you'd go a bit slower, it still got a very, very good rate of fire. So that's good for it. Range is pretty decent. Weight of shell, not spectacular. Armor piercing capability is all right at 20,000 yards. Um, bursting charge is on the higher end of the overall spectrum, but not as high as some of the other shells in the picture, but with no particular weaknesses, apart from just perhaps being slightly on the lighter side of things when it comes to shell weight and that strong rate of fire, the Bismarck's guns come in with 5.3 out of 10. And then as we get to the top end of our mid-range pack, we also have what are technically the joint third place podium finishers, the 16-inch 45 caliber weapon from the North Carolina and South Dakota class ships, and the 15-inch guns from the Richelieu class of France. Now, in comparison, 
The American 16-inch gun has a significantly better rate of fire than the French 15-inch uh, weapon. The American gun is near the top of the range for rate of fire. In fact, it's only really bettered by the Bismarck, but the French one's a bit slower. Weight of shell, unsurprisingly, super heavy 16-inch shell means that it's a joint second, along with the Iowa's guns, because they're using the same shells, considerably heavier than Richelieu's. But uh, Richelieu scores a strong comeback with range. The 16-inch 45, not capable of going anywhere near as far as a Richelieu's 15-inch gun, albeit that Okay, in part that's because of the weight of shell difference. A heavier shell will obviously fall shorter, but also Richelieu can elevate its guns a bit further. Armour piercing capability of both guns is, at 20,000 yards is, again, a good score. 6.5 for the American, 6.2 for the French. Both well above average and roughly in contention with each other with the French gun edging out on bursting charge, although it's an inch smaller in calibre, it actually carries a considerably larger explosive payload, a signature issue with some American, with most American shells. And so they end up both scoring 5.5. To be honest, broadly speaking, the American gun has slightly stronger performance characteristics overall. It's just that the French range really really gives it a bit of a boost up and the fact that it's AP potential at 20,000 yards is broadly similar is pretty good as well. And then we're on to second and first place. In second place we have the 16 inch 50 caliber gun found on USS Iowa. It's got a good rate of fire, it's got a good weight of shell, of course 16 inch super heavy shell, it's got a decent range its armor piercing capability at 20,000 yards is the second best. It's pretty spectacular. It's going to hurt an awful lot. And even though it's got a somewhat low bursting charge for its shell size, it's still scoring a 4.4 out of 10 there. So it's within the, sort of the mid tier of acceptable. So what you have with a 16 inch 50 gun is something that's turning in strong performances across pretty much all categories under consideration with the exception of the bursting charge, and even then it's not awful, it's just a little bit subpar for the calibre of shell. So with no particular weaknesses and a lot of strengths, the 16 inch 50, with a 6.4 out of 10 score. And then finally, in terms of surface-to-surface -surface battleship guns, well, there is only one, sh one gun left, and that is the 18.1 inch gun on Yamato. Similar to the Iowa's gun, it only returns one kind of okay-ish score and everything else is strong, but the degree to which those results are strong is just that little bit more. Its rate of fire at 4.5 out of 10 is not spectacular. There's a lot of guns on this table that are faster firing, but it's still more than capable of keeping up with a, a decent well, sort of maybe one round every 30 to 35 seconds, right? But, shockingly enough, at 18.1 inches, the weight of shell is by far the heaviest. It's the, the heaviest shell there. Range is only marginally beaten out with 9.8 out of 10 by the 15 inch of the Latorios. Its armor piercing capability at 20,000 yards is spectacular. It's the highest of all. Um, and the bursting charge, again, unsurprisingly, given that it's an 18.1 inch shell, is also the top by a long, long way, giving it an overall score of 7.8 out of 10 and rendering it in terms of purely the gun, the single best surface to surface anti-ship weapon of the Second World War. Now, of course, you do have to take into account that by the time you're talking about our two top podium place guns, the 16 inch 50 and the 18.1 inch, their armor piercing capabilities are such at 20,000 yards that materially speaking, assuming your enemy is broadside, it probably doesn't make a tremendous amount of difference which one you're hit by. But if you're taking something that is perhaps one of the more heavily armored vessels of the period, like King George V or a Yamato, and you put it at an angle, there may be a slight margin wherein the difference between those two guns might actually matter. But there you go.
Yamato's 18.1 inch gun coming out top, followed closely by the 16 inch 50 of the Iowas and everything else kind of left trying to pick up the scraps thereafter. So there you have my findings. Let me know in the comments below what you think. Did I use the right data set values? Should I have used other data? And if so, where can I find it? Should I have used less data? Do you perhaps like the second set of sheets that I produced where I didn't include for range? Do you think they perhaps reflect the reality a little bit more? Or do you think this result is a little bit more accurate in broad terms as to the overall capabilities of the weapons? Should I perhaps repeat the entire process for World War One era guns? See how everything stacks up when you're including a lot more 12 inch guns and some of the guns that we looked at in the pre-1930s section are operating under their older paradigms. It's a possibility for the future, I suppose. But as always, feel free to discuss below or via email, via Discord, etc, etc. And I'll see you again in another video. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.